Protesters take to the streets of Romania, just the latest European citizens to feel the pinch of austerity measures. Romania's fiscal squeeze is largely being driven by the International Monetary Fund. But is economic austerity the correct prescription? And should the IMF have the power to impose it? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Taymor Nabili. An international mission is visiting Romania to review its loan deal. This as anti-government protesters clash with police in anger at economic conditions. Despite job and wage cuts and a tax hike, Romania had, until now, avoided the type of violent street protests seen in Greece and other European states. But now Romania's Prime Minister has warned anti-government protesters that more violence will not be tolerated. Nick Spicer reports from Bucharest. The wave of discontent rippling across Europe has reached some 40 cities and towns in Romania. On Sunday night, rock throwers, police said were football hooligans, disrupted the otherwise peaceful demonstration in the capital, injuring some 60 people. On Monday, the Prime Minister said the right to assembly would be respected, but police were going to stop anything else. Street violence will not be tolerated, but peaceful demonstrations are acceptable. I understand people are suffering, but their problems can't be fixed overnight. But the demonstrators are tired of waiting. Uh, yesterday they were a little bit violent. I don't know uh, where did it start, but we don't want violence, we only want change. We are a fight, a fighting people. We are, we are going to fight for our freedom and for our rights forever. We'll stay here until they go. This is the man they most want to go, President Trajan Bacescu, who has considerable powers under the Constitution. He was long popular with many Romanians, seen as a man of the people. No more. It's been a long time since Romanians took to the streets like this. And even though their numbers are not massive, there is a definite whiff of people power in the air. The list of grievances may be long, and there may be no visible leader, but there is a man who sparked it all off. Rad Arafat, a respected emergency room doctor from Palestine originally, quit his cabinet job running the country's emergency medicine. He wanted to protest over a plan to partially privatize the ambulance service. Arafat set up the first such service in post-communist Romania, initially using his own car. The government reversed course, but it was too late. Arafat's gesture appears to have mobilized a public often described as disillusioned and tired of politics. Nick Spicer for Inside Story, Bucharest. Well, let's give you a little background on the situation in Romania in the run-up to these riots. Now, before the global economic recession, Romania enjoyed almost a decade of steady economic growth, strong demand from EU markets, and domestic consumption and investment fueled GDP growth. But it also caused a widening budget deficit. And then, in the last quarter of 2008, the country really began to feel the effects of the global downturn. In 2009, its GDP fell more than 7 percent, prompting the government to ask for an emergency loan from international lenders. In 2010, with the country on the verge of bankruptcy, the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission and the World Bank all granted a loan of some 20 billion euros. But there were conditions. Drastic austerity measures were part of that loan agreement. Another 1.9 percent contraction in GDP followed in that year. And then in 2011, we saw a modest return to growth. GDP was up by 1.9 percent in the third quarter, which was the highest quarterly number in the EU. So, is the IMF helping or hindering Romania's financial stability? To answer this question, I'm joined in Bucharest by Adrian Ion. He's the publisher of the magazine The Diplomat. In Brussels, Piotr Kaczynski is a research fellow at the Centre for European Policy Studies. And in Skopje, Sam Vaknin is the editor-in-chief of the online news service The Politician. He's also been an advisor to several Eastern European governments. 
Gentlemen, thank you all indeed for being with us today. Adrian, in Bucharest, let me begin with you, if I might. Just to sum up the conditions on the streets at the moment and tell us, are these riots to be taken in the same sort of manner as what we've been seeing elsewhere in Europe? I don't really think so. And um, to be honest, I personally believe that the momentum has passed. Uh, there are still a few hundred people at the moment in the university square, but um, uh, I don't think that the riots will spread or they will become um, at a national level like you might have seen in Greece or other countries. Um, I think, like I said, the momentum has passed. What makes, what and, makes you think um, that, that they might have run out of steam? Because uh, the economic conditions, clearly, as we, we sort of outlined, are, are pretty grim. And certainly, if uh, Europe continues on the path that it's on, Romania's major market is in serious trouble. So that's not going to help Romania's own domestic economy, is it? Well, it depends who you compare Romania with. If you compare it to the, some of the neighboring countries, I would say that Romania is um, a stable country. If you look at the macroeconomic figures um, for 2012 estimations, uh, again, Romania um, is in a pretty good shape, I would say. And the main concern of the government is to keep the country stable, which um, it has. Um, and I don't think that um, there are any reasons for a real concern that Romania might um, slip into uh, a difficult economic crisis more than it is already. OK, let's go to uh, Piotr Kaczynski. Um, uh, for your opinion, do you, do you concur? Well, uh, it seems that way. I mean, the news came that uh, the conflict that was at the bottom line of this current situation uh, between the uh, former state secretary uh, for health, responsible for health reforms, uh, has uh, made some compromise with the president on, on comeback to the government. So uh, in this particular case, uh, the situation might be a little bit more stable now. But, um, and as, as always, every local conflict has its own context, but uh, it doesn't change the situation where in the streets of Bucharest, what we saw over the last days, uh, looks at least similarly to, the, to what we've seen in other places in Europe over the last months. Uh, and what do you think of the broader prescription for uh, the economy in, uh, in Romania? Do you, do you think uh, as a... Uh, as, uh, Adrian was, was trying to suggest that the worst is over, or do you think the ongoing problems of Europe are bound to have some kind of knock-on effect in Romania? Well, it's difficult to say if the, if the worst is over, because what we've seen is that a set of secondary importance issue triggers, um, triggers uh, massive protests, um, and then they can, they can run out of steam uh, within days. Uh, so. We do not know exactly what's going on in the sense of uh, how stable the situation will be. My sort of uh, outside uh, perspective would be rather that Romania is a stable country and it's probably more peaceful than neighboring uh, Hungary, for example, or a little bit more to the south, uh, Greece. Uh, however, everywhere in Europe, everywhere in Europe, including Western Europe and Eastern Europe, Northern and Southern, uh, there is uh, Europe is boiling to some extent uh, and uh, there are social pressures on societies in Europe uh, that cause uh, eruptions, sometimes very uh, short eruptions like we just saw in, in Bucharest. Sam Vaknin, let me come to you uh, and, and suggest that perhaps maybe the uh, behavior of the citizens on the streets is not necessarily uh, the biggest issue here. The biggest issue is still the state of the economy, not only in Romania, but across the whole of Europe, uh, and how the economic, uh, the economic situation is being handled by the powers that be. Would you agree with that? Well, I think uh, the IMF's involvement in Eastern and Central Europe raises four issues, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. The first issue is that the IMF's main task is to secure the interests of creditors, external creditors, mainly banks, but also other, country, under other countries and international financial institutions. So the IMF is concerned mainly with liquidity and solvency at all costs. It has no interest whatsoever in social costs, political costs, and even trade costs. The second problem is that many 
people in Central and Eastern Europe, having survived the ordeal of communism, regard the IMF as kind of substitute central planner. They, regard, they think that the IMF uh, uh, breaches their national sovereignty. So there's the issue of national sovereignty, to, which, to what extent the IMF can, can interfere in setting national priorities and, and uh, preferences. The third issue is that uh, local politicians, many of them corrupt and inept, scapegoat the IMF. They point at the IMF as the culprit when they misallocate economic resources, abscond with funds, or simply implement uh, wrong economic measures. So this is the issue of moral hazard. The IMF gives cover to a corrupt, inept elite in many of these countries. And the fourth and last issue is, that, is the elephant in the room. Are the collective policies and prescriptions of the IMF and the World Bank, known as the Washington Consensus, are, the, are these collective prescriptions and policies counterproductive or helpful? I have been advisor to a few governments in Central and Eastern Europe, and it is my view, for whatever it's worth, that bottom line, the IMF is counterproductive in its involvement in these countries. Yes, it introduces measures of accountancy, transparency, long-term planning, and so on and so forth. It encourages, to some extent, the private sector. But on the other hand, the costs associated with implementing the Washington Consensus, the IMF program, are so enormous in the, sh in the medium and long term that they far outweigh any short-term economic benefits the IMF may bring about. All right, there's a lot to chew over there. Let me uh, put uh, the last point first then to, to you, Piotr. Do you think uh, that the Washington consensus is to blame here? Because we have heard from many other sources that the, the entire, even from Olivier Blanchard himself uh, writing recently, suggesting that perhaps the whole process of austerity measures that everyone went so hard on initially may perhaps be a little misleading in this context and perhaps even damaging. It might be the case. I'm not judging that. But w what we have to recognize is a sort of separation of powers and sp separation of roles. How can we talk about sovereignty uh, if you run out of cash? If Romania, in, the, in this particular situation, uh, is running out of cash and requires external assistance. If it requires external assistance, it's obvious that the money that are coming to assist Romania are going to be conditional. And the, the conditionality is, in this case, put forward by IMF uh, and others. All right, other that's, let me stop you there but for a what moment, Piotr. is that, that I, let me just finish this one, one point, because it's okay. a very important point that I want to make, is that IMF is not bringing legitimacy. It is the responsibility of the domestic government to bring this legitimacy forward with the, domestic, with the population. All right, let me put that di directly back to Sam then. How do you respond? Well, of course, there's condition conditionality. The question, I, I think um, uh, he, he missed the point. The question is, which conditions? The question is, what conditionality? Austerity measures, solvency and liquidity oriented programs are only one of a whole palette of possibilities. And it is, it, this option has been consistently chosen by, um, by the IMF, invariably, in a variety of contexts, in a variety of countries. And uh, I think, in, in total, it's counterproductive. The second point is that of moral hazard. I have witnessed time and again in many countries in Central and Eastern Europe and in Africa, where I used to work, politicians implementing wrong policies, misallocating resources, and absconding with funds, pointing the figure at the IMF, blaming the IMF for later austerity measures they have to implement to rectify what they have done. And that is so there is a shift of shift of responsibility, and that's what we call moral hazard in economics. And, and to a certain extent, let's get back to Adrian in Bucharest, to a certain extent, that's one of the problems of Romania, is the problem of corruption is, is what is fueling some of the unrest on the streets, isn't it? Has the, uh, the IMF's conditionality been part of the problem in, in this whole setup, do you think? Basically, the IMF in Romania is not perceived as being uh, the one um, to blame for what's happening in the, in the country. Uh, the IMF is perceived to be more like a watchdog uh, over the money that has um, been landed to Romania. And uh, the fear of corruption is um, always one of the first um, words that come up when you speak about the Romanian state. Um, the Romanian state is perceived to be um, 
um, a part um, of of um, um, of people which are very corrupt, which uh, don't um, use the resources as they should be, and uh, the IMF um, basically wants to know what um, uh, they do with the money, and um, I don't think that um, the people out in the streets are. Uh, protesting against um, the IMF or the measures that the IMF told the Romanian government to take, but they are protesting against the government, the, the uh, members of the government, and. Um, but isn't the isn't, isn't that the um, point? I mean, the people on the the people on the streets might not be protesting against the IMF, but isn't the point here that uh, the government is corrupt and taking funds from the IMF one way or another uh, is actually helping that process? Um, Yes, but I don't think that people that got out on the streets um, at, at this moment uh, um, got out because um, the government is corrupt. Uh, basically, they saw in the last three years uh, the government taking some um, uh, very harsh measures. Uh, last year, um, there has been a cut of 25% in the salaries of the people working in the public sector um, and an increase of 5% in VAT. Uh, people do, didn't go out on the streets at that moment, which is very surprising to me, uh, although those were the measures, who, measures who, that affect them the most. And now they are going out because I think they say enough is enough right. and we want some change. All right, but well, I don't think that there are enough people there. Sam, let me ask you to comment on, on okay. those reflections. Do you agree with that analysis? Sorry? Do you agree with that Would analysis the question? from Ion, uh, Adrian Ion? Well, ve vehemently, no, I do not agree. The austerity measures, the, people, are, people started protesting in the streets of uh, Bucharest and later in other cities against the implementation of the health care reform, privatization of certain emergency services. That, is one of the re that was this one of the conditional con conditions and requirements of the IMF in the 2009 agreement. In every repeated report that the IMF issued, including the report in December 2011 and the report in October 2011, the IMF mentions that progress should be made on privatizing healthcare and, pr and, and reforming the tax administration. All the austerity measures implemented since the recession of 2009-10, all of them, without a single exception, have been dictated by the IMF. Now, that, that is not to say that these measures are entirely wrong, that some of them are not productive, that they should not have been, but they came from the IMF. They emanated from the IMF. People are protesting in the streets against the personality of Basescu, who is authoritarian and unpleasant and so on and so forth, but they are also protesting against austerity measures and privatization measures and lack of functioning institutions and so on and so forth that are a direct unequivocal, unambiguous consequence of an agreement signed with the IMF in 2009, hmm. period. All right. <laughs> That's as simple as that. Well, P Piotr, you, you mentioned earlier on uh, a, f a good point in response to Sam, uh, and that is that no one lends money without there being conditions because they want to make sure they get it back. But I want you to, uh, to, to respond to, to Sam's point there that, yes, OK, there, were, there should be conditions, but do they necessarily need to be these conditions that have so often been shown to actually harm the people who live in the countries that are being imposed, the conditions are imposed on? Well, I, w I would put it this way. I, I share actually most of what has been said, I, and I don't contradict what has been said before. But what I want to say, uh, underline is the following. The IMF conditionality is going to be f um, working only if it's done in com in, um, uh, together with the local government. With the, in this case, with the Romanian government. If it is the IMF telling the Romanians what to do, it's probably not going to work properly because nobody knows best uh, how Romania functions than Romanians themselves. Therefore, IMF is not going to be fully successful in protecting its money uh, if it tells uh, what should be done uh, to the local people. But it's not the IMF who are elected people. It is the local governments who are elected. And they hold their responsibility and they hold their legitimacy. Um, and they have to always keep on board the, uh, the, the society at large. Therefore, it is their responsibility uh, to convey the messages and to uh, be prepared whenever those uh, discussions, those negotiations uh, happen. And we see that it's never easy. And there's plenty of conflicts everywhere in Greece, in Romania, 
Romania to a lesser degree, in Hungary, in Italy as well, uh, in Spain, obviously. But, but those tensions are inbuilt. And now, it is the responsibility of the political class to make sure and that they know what they really want from the IMF, ex uh, not only the money, but what sort of um, austerity measures they can take and what sort of austerity measures they mm. cannot take. Uh, and they should know it best when they sit together with the IMF. All right, well, uh, Adrian, let me come to you. You say that uh, the, the population uh, and presumably the government doesn't blame the IMF for the problems uh, that the country has had. But in a broader not sense... Not entirely, at least. In a broader sense, though, uh, tell, tell us what the, the government and the people of Romania think about their membership of the EU. Do they think that being part of this body that right now is fighting for its very life was a good move and will prove to be beneficial for them in the future? I wouldn't know how to answer to that because I don't think they really have a clear idea. Being member of the EU until now for the Romanians only meant um, um, easier access abroad, um, easier access of goods, but uh, we haven't really been affected like in the way, for example, Greece was by adopting the euro or um, other measures which were, um, for example, uh, for Greece or other countries um, seen as being um, um, uh, as a neg uh, having an, a negative impact uh, on the population. So I don't think that Romanians have anything against mm. Romania joining the EU. All right, but Piotr, very quickly, let me turn the question around to you and ask, from the EU perspective, is there any problem with Romania's membership? I mean, there are so many peripheral countries now who are proving to be uh, a burden on the EU itself. Might Romania be seen in that light at some point? Well, I, I guess retrospectively, quite a few people think uh, that 2007 enlargement was premature, um, if not entire 2004 and 7 enlargements at all. Uh, I don't share that view. Um, Romania is uh, is a full uh, full scale member of the European Union. Uh, it's not part of the of the euro area, but it is a member of the European Union with all the rights and obligations. And again, uh, mm. if there are obligations uh, when it comes to the membership in the European Union, uh, it might be that the political class missed uh, that part when discussing the issue with the public at large, only promising uh, the goodies and forgetting about. Uh, the sticks. Uh, yeah. They promised, for example, in Romania, uh, the lifting of the of the border controls, and we see how difficult that is. Uh, it's not going to be easy, and uh, it's been what uh, all five years now that uh, that uh, Romania is in the European Union, and okay. Schengen is still uh, at least a few months away. We're almost out of time, so I'll put the, the final question uh, to Sam. Sam, you brought up the issue of the Washington consensus uh, and criticised it for its, uh, its uh, effects and its uh, general tenor. So tell us, given in, in a world where the Washington consensus still seems to be the driving motive, the driving force of economic policy, um, where are we going now? Not just in Romania, but in the other European nations where so much problem is going on. How, how do you read the developments from this point onwards? If the, uh, I, I just want to say one thing. Uh, ne negotiations in the context of talking to the IMF is a euphemism. The IMF dictates. The IMF does not negotiate. Without the imprimatur of the IMF, no country can borrow money in the international markets, country in distress. So these are diktats. They are not negotiations, negotiated agreements. And the local politicians are absolutely helpless and hapless and unable to resist the IMF pressure if they really need the money. Mm. If the Washington consensus is implemented in its full severity throughout the European Union, and I'm talking e even about countries such as France and Germany, believe it or not, because they are, in my view, about to enter the crisis uh, full scale, then Europe will, uh, will be devastated. I have seen the Washington consensus implemented in another continent, in Africa. Right. I have seen the Washington consensus implemented in, southern, in the southern, southeastern uh, Europe, in the Balkans. And that's not a sight to behold. All right. The Washington consensus safeguards the banks, not the countries. A sobering point on which to end this discussion. Thanks very much to all three of our guests. In Bucharest, Adrian Eon. In Brussels, Piotr Kaczynski. And in Skopje, Sam Vaknin. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And if you want to send us any feedback, just email your thoughts to insidestory at aljazeera.net. That's it for now. Until next time, bye-bye.